Aite atua, i o matua nui. Tukua mai tō wairua tapu i runi a mātou i tēnei mahi nui nui, a da mahi ki te whakapai, ki te whakatika, te tai ao, mai nā mauna, ki nā awa, ki te moana toi, moana nui a kiwa, ki te whenua. Manaki, chaki hi a mātou, tēnā koe. I'm up here on Mount Tarawera, a taonga for the Bay of Plenty and the Lakes District. Join us on an epic journey as we check out some of the most beautiful parts of this rohi, the waterways from summit to sea. We'll explore the impacts that industrial land use and poor rules and regulation is having on our human health and our environment. The Bay of Plenty is abundant in all of the core natural characteristics that define Aotearoa New Zealand as our home. From geothermal wonders, freshwater lake systems, thousands of years of ash deposits from volcanic eruptions, and the perfect climatic conditions to produce the most impressive ancient podocarp rainforests in the world. These natural phenomena have set up some of the most richest and highly productive soils for industries like forestry, kiwi fruit, and dairy farming. However, we've forgotten the reciprocal nature of our relationship with the earth, and through rampant, sustained intensification of land use, are we pushing this part of Aotearoa to its limits? Ka ora te whenua, ka ora te tangata. We have Tipini Ma here from Ngati Rangitihi, and uh, Tipini's been a regional council for you know, over a decade and a half, seen a lot of changes. Uh, mate, you know, what do you see as the main cause of all these problems in this catchment? Well, um, as far as we're concerned, Ngāti Rangitihi, obviously we're sitting on our mountain, Mount Tarawera, and it flows, the, the Tarawera River flows out of Lake Tarawera, mm. and it goes down to Tasman and is polluted by Tasman Pulp and Paper Mill, yeah. and then it flows on down to Maratar, and look, it is just one of many of the Bay of Plenty rivers that are being polluted by industries. Nothing's improving. It's actually getting worse. We're going to take a good look at this catchment and a few other catchments and have a look around the lakes and bring forward to the people what's uh, going on out here and document some of the destruction and also some of the positive things that are happening and see if that can have a, have a positive effect. All right, should we get into it? Yeah, I reckon. There's a lot of work to be done. There is a pokotoki that lots of people are using more and more, and different people have different ways of saying it. You know, you know, patu ngaro ngaro he tangata tu toi whenua. Toi tu means to stand forever, I suppose. Ngaro means to disappear. You know, we've got to remember that we are a climax species. We come and we disappear, but the land, no matter happens, will remain. That really gives us the priority that is our foundation. And so, kaoro te whenua, when the land is well, kaoro te tangata, we are well. Here, in the uppermost parts of the catchment, we still have native forest remnants, but we are losing them to exotic weeds. It's places like the edge of Lake Tarawera, where our conservation department has totally dropped the ball on controlling this invasive vine, Japanese honeysuckle. Pest plants are being left to run rampant and choke our native forests to death. Sadly, the regional council views this plant as a low priority and too far gone. If we consider the final impact once weeds have run their course, the consequences of failing to act are too dire to contemplate. Weeds are a challenge we all face, and we have got to be more bold if we are going to save our forests.
There are few streams remaining still cloaked with a forest canopy. The Waikokupu Restoration Group has an ambitious vision to remedy this and restore the health of the Little Waihi Estuary. So I'm here with Tom Anderson from the Waihi Catchment Restoration Group. Yep. And uh, Tom's been doing a lot of water testing, sampling, uh, to put together some data, you know, to paint a picture of what's going on, what's feeding into the estuary. Tom, maybe you can tell us a little bit about your work. Yeah, so Waikokupu uh, is the catchment restoration group here. Uh, we were formed in 2019 by some interested landowners or concerned farmers and residents uh, about the state of the Waihi estuary right. down the bottom um, because it's, it's quite heavily degraded um, from intensified land use yeah. uh, basically over time. Uh, yeah, so we work with those landowners to um, restore wetlands and retire steep erosion prone land mm -hmm. uh, and also work with farm systems to and farmers themselves to see if they can change their farm system to have less impact on the land but remain profitable. So that's removing animals from wetlands, steep slopey areas, trying to stop yeah. the sediment going into the waterways so that it doesn't end up in the estuary where the shellfish are. And yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Cool. So trying to increase that, I guess, buffer between the intense land use and, and the water itself. Cool. I'll sure grab some samples. Let's do it. Sweet. <laughs> renowned agroecologist and veterinarian Dr. Alison Dews, a fourth generation dairy farmer, shares her perspective towards a more holistic approach to land use, care for our water and our people. So the estuaries and the river mouths are basically the voice of what happens from the mountains to the sea. And in our catchment we've got three rivers that start at the lakes and then they make their way down through the land with springs coming up in the middle and then down to the lowlands where the estuary basically is the collection point of everything that's gone on in the catchment. And in our catchment we've got a mix of forestry, dairy farming, dry stock farming and uh, horticulture and significant land use change. We've probably got one of the most intensive catchments in New Zealand and um, one of the most heavily degraded estuaries in New Zealand as well. Basically in the estuary it receives everything from the sediment, the nutrients, the pathogens or E. coli that comes from ruminants and being at the lowest point it's the reflection of all the land use that's occurred in that catchment. Much of the lowland fertile soil in the Bay of Plenty has been produced through volcanic eruptions and eons of dense kaikatea forest growing on rich wetlands. These forests were logged, wetlands were drained, carbon released, rivers straightened, the kaikatea forests were pushed to extinction, and production animals were introduced. Each generation has their go at intensifying land use. More bushes cleared, more wetlands are drained, remnant forests are grazed out, production goals continually increased. More grass sown, more animals, more pollution, and more debt. Land inputs increase like fossil fuel derived synthetic nitrogen fertilizer, Unlined effluent ponds leach into groundwater. Pump stations clear drains empty into rivers. Waste flowing through soil substrates with phosphorus bound sediments, all flowing out to the coast. E. coli in the estuary, polluting the kaimoana, causing sick stomachs. Pakaru pokus from paru water. When does it become unsustainable, environmentally and economically? Already we have gone too far for kaihikatea, streams and our estuaries.
This is the Tarawera River. It comes from the lake, it flows through this volcanic rock, out the waterfall here where you can drink it, it's clean. And we're surrounded by this rare inland Pahutakawa Rata forest which isn't really found anywhere else in the world. Now, these types of places are so important for biodiversity, for climate, and to recreate ourselves. If we don't do everything we can to protect these natural spaces, it says a lot about us as society. The canopy is being attacked by possums. Without action, trees like Pohutukawa, Rata, Rewirewa and Tōtara are all doomed. Soon there will be nothing left. Our unique forests remain healthy and vibrant for millions of years, with an abundance of plants, birds, reptiles and insects. Plagues of Australian possums are eating their way through the forest canopy. Introduced deer, goats, wallabies and pigs are destroying the undergrowth and seedlings. No flowers, no nectar or fruit, no food for birds, no seedlings, no regeneration, no future canopy. As native trees vanish, so do the birds and insects. When biodegradable 1080 is used, the forest bounces back to life. Repeated applications further enhance recovery. The Modi is restored. Imagine flocks of 200 kiridu again. But the reality today decimated the Rewirewa, Rata, Kohi Kohi, and so many others reflect our current lack of commitment to protect this amazing taonga that defines what makes our nation unique. So here we see a native avocado, the mangiao. It's also uh, heavily impacted by pests, so this time we've got goat damage. A bit of ring barking here with their horns. Strips away the layer that the tree needs to survive and then, yeah, unfortunately the tree's passed away, so we're not seeing the understory taking over to replace the canopy. This is a tortoise tree up at the top of the river here. Now there's trees like this throughout the forest, including Pahutakawa and Rata, that have had their leaves totally eaten off them. The, you can see the possums using their trunks as a highway to run up and down. And it's a real shame that broad scale possum control has been abandoned in this Dock estate. Now down here we've got a Taiwan cherry seedling. These trees are really dangerous. They can shade out all the native plants and take over the canopy. So it's really important that we get on top of weed control and predator control so we can protect these natural spaces. Kaitiaki of Tu Haurangi, Ngāti Wahiao and Ngāti Whakauwe, Wally Lee, has a deep connection to the Lakes District and a long history of standing up to polluting industries in order to safeguard human and environmental health. So then this is the mill here and yeah. I believe the Puaringa runs down across here. Oh no, it runs across this way. So that one might be the Puaringa proper. That goes yeah. at the back of the that's mill, right? That's what I see it on maps. It goes at the yeah, back yeah. of the mill. So that's the, that's the original yeah. Puaringa. Uh, you can see all the surface water mm. and mud and who knows what's going into oh, that. Oh, oh. And then that's, yeah. 
Like, it's coming out pretty thick, eh? This is another stream here joining. And that's after not not very much rainfall, you know? It, was only, it wasn't heavy, heavy rainfall, but enough to show that their ponds are just a waste of time. So that's the Puerenga now, eh? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's beyond the confluence. Mm -hmm. Only just, yeah, going down from it. The Puaringa, you know, it's a, you know, quite a well-known stream. What, what's your connection to it? So my people have lived uh, along the banks of the Puaringa and the wider catchment for a number of generations. My grandparents lived on the banks of the Puaringa River. And of course, I used to go and visit them when I was uh, uh, young. Our whanau homestead is in Whakareurewa, in the village. So in those early years, as uh, young people, we always visited our, our koro and our kuia. And um, we spent a lot of time uh, running around the village. It was our backyard. At the time when I was young, I could never swim because uh, I had um, bad ears. And um, so all I ever wanted to do as a young kid was uh, swimming the Puaringa with my cousins. And I never got the opportunity until I was 15. And by that stage, we were living in Australia and we came home for a holiday, a summer holiday. And so, of course, the first thing I did, I was able to swim by then. My ears had been had a couple of operations and mm. all the rest of it. And uh, first thing I did was jump in the river. And uh, so I swam in the river for a week in uh, the summer of 1986-87. Yeah, but then I was struck down. I was sick for the uh, the next week or so uh, after that. And because, not like my cousins were, who lived in the water every day, they're exposed to this stuff every day. And uh, as I said, in some other interviews, I spoke to my father about it, and he knew straight away I'd been swimming in the river. Because uh, he used to go running up in the forest, and he saw where they used to uh, dump rubbish and, and um, well, toxins, sorry. Mm. And uh, so he knew the forest intimately and he knew where they had, uh, uh, the old Waipa State Mill had, had dumped poisons up into the forest as well, as okay. well as dumping it into the, the river itself. Pentachloral fennel is how, what they used to treat the timber with, mm. the, the preservative, with uh, PCP, which is a uh, persistent organic pollutant, I believe it's yep. called. Yep. Yep. And so that's, that's uh, yeah, of course, but that research didn't come until much later. Yeah. But it never left my mind and my memory of, uh, number one, the joy of uh, swimming in the river finally, but then the pain that followed it and, and the illness that, 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 I, that I suffered as a result. And would you go for a swim in the river today? I have never touched it with bare skin since. Just kilometres down the river from that beautiful piece of old growth forest, we're in a pine plantation and there's all these shade tolerant weeds like privet, Taiwan cherry, a bit of cotoneaster. Now if we don't get on top of these weeds, we risk losing our native forests. It's the shade tolerant ones that do the damage, they come up through the undergrowth. If we want to be serious about protecting these bits of forest, we need to get on top of weed control. Plants that stay at home are fine but some kinds of plants are not so well behaved. If they're not native and they jump the fence, they are green aliens, ready to invade our nature. They are spread by birds and wind. These plants, they escape, over the fence, down the roadsides, hop along hedgerows, travel the train tracks, wander the waterways, searching for wild nature to invade. When they find unkempt land, they multiply exponentially, build up forces, stock up seeds, ready to invade your beautiful forests, wetlands and wilderness areas.
Can you speak to your early memories of the Tarawera and or how you My yeah. early memories, um, going with my father, and as I say, I was born in 1954, and that's the year Tasman started making paper and polluting our river. The Black Drain, we called it, and we've, we've always called it the Black Drain. And um, we'd go white baiting with our dad, and we'd be at the river mouth white baiting, and we'd see hoses coming down and, and drums would be floating down the river, you know, just like straight rubbish. And whānau of ours that we knew were working in there, were, they, they were saying that they were told by their boss, oh, no, just, you know, at night time, two in the morning, I'll go and back that truck and just tip it in the river. Because the, the, the Tasman Pulp and Paper 1954 Enabling Act enabled them to use our river as a D-class river, which is the lowest um, denomination. A is perfect, D is you can do what you like with this river. This is coming down the hour? Yeah. And then this is the bridge. That oh, that's one of the first the oxidation pond, yeah. That there is Rotiiti Puku. It used to be a, a lake in there and it, now it's now it's all filled over, it's just been built in. With what? And, with dirt and, and oh, years of, yeah. they were, yeah, uh, tins of chemicals and all sorts. And so the contaminants going in? Oh, oh yeah, all, everything you can name, yeah, yeah. No, this is a, you know, this is the, the end result after being making paper. Now they're not making paper, but they're still making pulp. What are the main concerns around having this go back into the river? I mean, it's trashed the lake. Oh, hell yeah. With people with houses. Yeah, or it's what? trashed this lake here. Uh, Rotorua was a beautiful lake in Rotiiti Paku where the way you were too funny tall flows into is, uh, it, it's just totally, it's been filled in with dirt. It's, a, it's like a couple of three or four football fields of area that were, you know, a lot of contaminants went in there. They're actually using this water from the, below the mill to, to irrigate their farms. So, I mean, do the Chinese and Japanese who buy our milk know that some of the, the milk from Ichigam Fonterra anyway is, uh, been um, harvested through uh, uh, that sort of water being used to irrigate. What, what sort of milk is it doing? You know, that's, it's going into the grass, the cows will be, when it's getting irrigated. Once upon a time, Onipu people, our people up at Kaurade, could catch white bait, you know, on the other side of this oxidation pond. Just put their net in and, and catch white bait. But with straightening of the river and also the pollution of the river, um, Oh no, the white bait that were once uh, plentiful in the Tarawera River was known as the, you know, the white bait uh, capital river basically in the Eastern Bay before the, before the, the pollution started. From a dairy point of view, we've got a lot of dairy right through the mid and lower catchments. And again, it's about looking at how these farms can tread more lightly on the land with fewer cows, less cropping, making sure that they protect the soils, making sure they've got areas for cows to stand off and get shade and, and then cows to be comfortable as well. But apart from that, also focusing on how they don't use so much fertiliser, how that they use a lot less nitrogen, have a more varied diet for the cows with sort of a, a, a cow salad, if you like, so that you've got plants in there that are deep rooting and fixing nitrogen from the atmosphere. So a whole lot of things need to come together for a farm system, especially a dairy farm system, to tread more lightly and use a lot less inputs. You know, the farmers, and the good farmers are really wanting to do the right thing. They're looking at how they reduce stock rates, how that they reduce their fertiliser. As they start using less fertiliser, they start saying, hey, have we been using too much for too long? It's quite a realisation for a lot of them. So it's about just taking the foot off the pedal, taking the pressure off the people, the pressure off the animals and the pressure off the land in a way that's good for everyone. And we know it works. We know it's profitable. It's just actually a mindset change and a change of heart in how we do things.
Kia ora, I'm John Perk. Uh, we're at Pukakauri Farm in Katikati. The farm is jointly owned with myself and my twin brother, Rick. Uh, Rick's the farmer and um, I'm a landowner and doing a lot of environmental work alongside my bro. It's probably got the biggest pastoral grazing area along this part of uh, Katikati, um, under the Kaimai Range. It's about 300 hectares. Just after they bought it, they were pro uh, approached by the Regional Council to say, this farm is one of the most degraded farms in, uh, in the Western Bay of Plenty with loss of sediment. Um, and uh, we want to help you guys to uh, rectify that. One of the key parameters or metrics they used to rate that was that the seagrass, the zostra, they measured that right across the Tauranga Moana back in 1956, I think it was, and took the hectareage. And then they looked at the gradual reduction through sedimentation over time. In our catchment, Tamania catchment, it had gone from something like 90 hectares to zero. So we were the worst. And the sediment levels down the bottom were terrible. And so uh, for me, it was looking at what can we do more. The first thing we looked at were what we termed the critical source areas. So these are former wetlands on the property and started targeting retiring those. One of the things we've learned is that before you even plant any plants, you need to get the weeds under control. So quite a few of those sites have got existing weeds in there, like blackberry, gorse, which is not too much of an issue really, but uh, then you've got honeysuckle, you've got old man's beard, and weeds like that, quite invasive, uh, viney type weeds, you really have to smash them, get them out of the way. One of the things that I always tell farmers is, don't be in a rush to plant, always get the weeds under control first. And that may take a year, could take 18 months if it's particularly bad. Come back, smash the weeds, and then plant. And for me it was a learning curve, but one of the things I'd been involved with was another project around plantation manuka forestry grade species, these are little plants about 30 centimetres high, really cheaply plant them like pine trees, get them well spaced around three metre spacings and use that to retire areas for wetland back into a repo and, uh, and that sort of thing. Six years ago we had cattle grazing in here, yeah. and so 2016 we retired it. So this is basically a little over five years old. And in here, this area we're standing, Jeff, this was just a rough, boggy area. And um, I planted a few tikauka, the cabbage tree and mm. harakeki. But really I thought, let's see what Papa Tuanuka can do here in terms of repairing herself. And here we are, we've got this fern. There's a wave coming through which is sort of like the first wage conditioning the soil. Yep. And we will have natural region happening here anyway without me planting sure. anything. We've got kio kio over there. We've got um, some sedges and so on, and um, oi oi coming through. So um, it's just naturally regenerating itself. So this wetland is one of eight uh, repo or wetlands we've established on the property. And it was just a boggy area, which was due to the fact that it's got a surrounding area where we get overland water flow and all the water collects there. Once that water with E. coli and sediment and phosphate attached to that gets into a water column, it's into the Tamania River and it's a pollutant. So for me, it was being able to intercept that water as it collects into that area. And that's creating a kidney to filter and cleanse that water so when it flows into the water column, there's no pollutants there. And that's pretty well what's happened. But not only that, we've planted these trees, these uh, colonizer species and wetland plants, and suddenly you see this whole little ecology develop. And it's just awesome. We've got little frogs, we've got birds, birds for Africa, where formerly it was just a, a dirty little piece of ground. And not only that, we've beautified our farm. That one particular wetland, it's now a beautiful native bush and wetland to drive past. So we've done that on across eight little sites on our property. Alongside that, we've looked at our steep land and retired some of that steep land into Nahedi. I was gonna put a little bit of it into pines, but I, I decided not to, and it's gone into native bush, yeah.
Back in those days, and even applies now, is this focus on, I call the EGA mentality, effective grass area. You've got to have as much grass on your property as possible. So we took a different approach. We started looking at our landscapes and, um, and looking at the marginal areas of the property, and that applied to steep land, but also some of those wetter, former wetlands, which don't grow much grass, you lose stock in them, and started to examine the economics of growing. Um, grass in those areas and we decided they were actually running at a loss. So we took out at least 20% of the farming area out of grass and put it back into native and surprisingly our total profit has gone up. So that means we're getting higher profit from a lesser area of land and that just shows that the, those pits of land that we've taken out were, um, were running at a loss to the farming business. I uh, call Trevor Ransfield, I hope. No Kutarere, I hope. I am Trevor Ransfield from Kutarere. Uh, my marae is Kutarere Marae, where we are sitting here today now. The estuary has always been a place for pipis. They all fed all the people, not just the whole kaina, even the people that went past or went by, going down to the coast, going to Tairawhiti, they stop in and grab a feed. Those days were plentiful. They were plentiful, the pippies. Uh, today, we're having trouble with the pippies down there because of the E. coli, what's in the water and that's coming from the cows. The main changes is through sediment that's coming from the valley up in the Waiotahi, down the Waiotahi Awa. The uh, E. coli that's come from the cow muck that's washed into the drains. Unlined, if you're in ponds, cause a lot of trouble. The overflow, where do they go? The effluent goes into the drains. Where does that go when it rains? And then it goes to one place, out into the Awa, from the Awa, out into the estuaries, from the estuaries, you collect all the pippies, fish, and where does that go? Into your stomach, into your kai. Not good. Not good. In our time, the cows were probably about 100, 150, some farmers, 400, 500, even more. So the more cows, the more cow muck and all that gets onto the whenua when it rains, gets all washed out into the drains. And where that goes, that goes out to the estuaries, to where all our kaimoana, our fish, our pippies, a big, huge concern. Wow, so what are we seeing in here, Tom? Yeah, so down this end of the stream, after all this rain, there's a whole lot more sediment um, and, and runoff that's built up in this water. Yeah, and this is coming off the marginal hillside country or kiwi fruit orchards? Yeah, yep, so uh, as the rain comes down, I guess we uh, don't really have those buffer zones anymore between the stream and our land uses. Um, so all the sediment and these light volcanic soils is just running straight off and into the stream. Right, and so it goes into the estuary and then what kind of impacts is it having on the ecology and people's health? 
Yeah, so a few things. I guess the sediment itself can, um, can start to smother our shellfish beds, which are filter feeders and actually filter the water as well. And E. coli also builds up and pathogens build up in the shellfish as they absorb it. Mm -hmm. So when there's a big load of, of things like E. coli in an event like this, it becomes inedible for humans. Um, Toxic. Yeah, those pathogens build up in the shellfish flesh, which means we can't consume them. Yeah, it's unfortunate. So what changes need to be made, you know, just basic changes or what changes are going on at the moment to help improve the estuary and this Kaikokupu, the stream? Yeah, so there's been a lot of landowners getting on board with um, riparian planting and it really comes down to, I guess, a multi-prong approach, but also every, every landowner doing their part and identifying critical source areas on their land, thinking, can I retire this into a wetland or does this really marginal, steep, erosion-prone land do I need to be farming that? Is it worth it? Yeah. Yeah, and, and if everybody's doing that, then we'll certainly have some change down the bottom here. Regional councils are failing us across the country and government's allowing them to do this. Well, what do you see as the, as the future for you know, looking after our rivers and our biodiversity? Well, uh, you know, the regional council is actually, uh, it's a law of, its, of itself and to say government's failing us with them, uh, they just do what they want anyway. Regional councils, they are a separate identity. Uh, the councils of New Zealand to the government, they have a minister as well. So, um, but the new generation coming up, they have to clean up all this pollution. You know, they're a whole lot more active. They will be, there, there is a groundswell of, of, of opposition to climate change and, and the pollution that, as I say, our generation has put on this world Mm. And especially on our country, mm. uh, because we're still trying to do it the same old, same old. We've been doing this for five generations, you know, so pollution of our rivers, pr pristine water. I mean, now we have um, green algae and rivers are unswimmable during summer. I mean, it's unheard of. Why are they unswimmable? Because they've got green algae that comes from phosphates and nitrates. We know where they're coming from, off the farms. So. Uh, it's not, it's not rocket science. You don't even need a whole lot of science on it. It's not rocket science. For about 30 or 40 years, farmers have been led to believe that more is better. And, you know, the whole industry structured itself around that. You know, we've got a lot of stainless steel around New Zealand. We've been producing high volumes of milk that's exported around the world. So there's been an indoctrination and a thinking that more is better and you know there's pressure on, been pressure on farmers to use more inputs, um, use more fertiliser, take on more debt, you know that's how they've been indoctrinated. So moving forward I think there's a real shift in the leading farmers thinking, they're thinking about future generations, they're thinking about how they build resilience how they are going to manage in a climate change world, and also what is it that they're leaving for the future. They understand how the activities on the land affect the water and then ultimately affect the receiving water body like the estuary, for example. So we're seeing a shift in values. You know, it's all been about more is better and making more money in a linear way, but now it's about how do we preserve people that want to work on the land? How do we look after the animals? How do we look after the soils? And as part of that, their thinking's really shifting. And we're really fortunate in our project to be working with really leading farmers who want to do the right thing, but they want to break away from the old patterns of thinking. We're on the banks of the Waiotahi River, and behind me here is a drain that's pumping farm waste out into the estuary. This is a classic example of a drain throughout the region that's putting farm waste into an estuary or a body of water we're just down, people are harvesting kai. Some of the changes we would like to see is the uh, waterways, uh, more planting. Uh, we like to see the uh, waterways also fenced off. We like to see some of the reduction and the reduction in the forestry and the mahi that they do. We want their sites cleaned up. Some of these sites that they do in the forestry it all comes down into the hour when it rains and floods and all that. And where do they go? It ends up here, out in the front or there, into the harbour, out here. 
We also like to see our children swimming in healthy water, our mukapuna eating healthy like we did in the 60s. Knowing that, that'll be great. That'll be an awesome outcome. We have national laws and standards to protect our environment and our natural resources and the abundance it provides. It sounds good, but they are not enforced most of the time and we are gradually losing what we have to pollution and other environmental damage. Where the rules aren't enforced, it is normally because a powerful player or an industry lobby group is able to muscle the regulators. This is prevalent in the fishing, farming and fertiliser industries, all responsible for vast amounts of environmental degradation. Some groups can be seen taking large amounts of money for conservation and redirecting it in ways that don't produce expected outcomes. The fact is, we still don't see positive changes when we are highly capable of making them. Does this mean that there is serious rot in the system? We must be aware of government agencies and regional councils being hijacked by polluters and power players to defeat the rules. The greed and power of these lobbyists is used to influence our government agencies. The result is that efforts to preserve our environment are cut off, discredited and shut down. Even with the law on our side, our communities struggle to push back. I think the thing that will turn people on is actually um, looking at their whenua, it might be a farmer, and starting small and saying, well, okay, let's establish a wetland somewhere. And that's pretty well what we did. And suddenly it's very enriching. You see these plants growing and you see um, nature coming back and you see uh, Papa Tuanuku starting to do our own thing in terms of restoring herself. And you want to do more. And for us, and, and I would say for every farmer, if they started on that journey, just small, get a feel for it, they can get help how to do it, it'll, it's, it's, um, it's quite captivating and you'll be wanting to do more. It's, um, and it's something that uh, is very healing for that person farming that land um, and their family, their whanau, to become involved with that. Um. You might see him a bit over here, but he never comes down. And then it can hit the sting, the stigma. Aye. But I'm just trying to see if there's, there's, there hasn't set any seed. Not yet. Uh, probably it doesn't come to later in the season. For people to start to reverse the decline that we see all around us, we first have to reconnect. Most New Zealanders are illiterate in terms of the environment. You know, I can walk into an area and I can say a whole lot of things about it, and most people see none of them. So the beginning point is we've got to reconnect back to whenua. Be quiet and hear the things that only quiet people can hear. That's the sort of thing that in actual fact we need to do to help to restore because when we actually heal the things that people can't normally hear, we begin to discover things in ourselves and we begin to discover life in ourselves and that's the beginning of our healing.